Like a lot of stories on the Lazarus Heist podcast, this one starts with a message offering an opportunity that seems too good to be true. They reached out via email. It seemed so out of left field. I just didn't actually believe that it was true. I thought it was maybe a a scam or a very specific hoax of some kind. This is Randy Griffin. She's a data scientist based in Boston and a former college ice hockey star. This email is offering something she'd dreamed of since she was a girl, a chance to play ice hockey at the Olympic Games. Playing in the Olympics was just this naive, childish dream, a dream I, I pretty much gave up on. Randy's dream was to play for Team USA, but this email seems to be coming from a South Korean hockey official. It's offering her the chance to try out for the host nation's team for the 2018 Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang, South Korea. Her mother was born there, but Randy's American. She's never even been to Korea, so the whole thing seems pretty bizarre and a bit sketchy. I ignored the first round of emails, actually, just thinking it wasn't real. It wasn't until they went as far as to find my dad's phone number, call him, ask him why I wasn't answering my email. I realized, okay, they're actually serious about this and I need to to, to make a decision. Well, our podcast is all about trying to warn people not to click on suspicious links right. and to be very wary about suspicious emails. Right. So, so good for you. <laughs> the email offer is very real. Ahead of the games, host nation South Korea decided to pull together the strongest women's ice hockey team possible. So they're looking abroad for the best players in the Korean diaspora, and Randy is on the list of candidates. Randy's pretty focused on grad school and her career, but she thinks, what the heck? And in 2015, she flies to South Korea for tryouts and she makes the team. The squad's a mix of South Korean players and Americans and Canadians with Korean heritage. Randy says there were a few linguistic and cultural issues to get around before they could really come together as a team. But after a couple of years of training, both in South Korea and the US, they're starting to feel match fit. And then in January 2018, less than two weeks before the Olympics opening ceremony, Randy's phone pings with yet another surprise. So I found out from a a New York Times alert on my phone. The article said that North and South Korea had agreed to field a joint women's ice hockey team. Kim Jong-un had decided at the last minute to send athletes to South Korea for the Games. Astonishing news given the hostility between the two countries. South Korea's president at the time, Moon Jae-in, had been suggesting this for a while. He sent multiple invitations to North Korea to join these Games. They got no response from Pyongyang until... Out of the blue, in his New Year's Day speech, Kim Jong-un suddenly signals that North Korea is interested after all. It's just one month before the event is due to start, leaving the Olympic hosts scrambling to make it happen. Officials from both Koreas had been holding secret talks about how to make the most of this thaw in North-South relations. They've agreed on a plan that had never been tried at an Olympics before. They want North and South Korean athletes to form a combined team, playing under a unified Korea flag. South Korea is okay with this, so long as it doesn't cost them a medal. So, they pick a sport where South Korea is not really in contention, women's ice hockey. But the news gets out before anyone can tell Randy and her teammates. Most of the girls at that time were actually on a plane. The girls got out of baggage claim and were mobbed by the media. And our coach is like, what is going on? And they were like, how do you feel about unifying with North Korea? And she's like, everybody keep your mouth shut and get on the bus. We were completely unprepared. Randy is about to compete in the biggest sporting event of her life, surrounded by a huge media circus. But that's not the only tumultuous event that's going to take place at the games. Even as Randy's team are reeling from the big announcement, Computer hackers are circling the event. The battle for power isn't just going to be on the ski slopes and ice rinks, it's going to happen digitally too. From the BBC World Service, this is The Lazarus Heist, Season 2. I'm Jean Lee. And I'm Jeff White. Episode 5, Olympic Destroyer.
When I'm not working on North Korea, you can usually find me off in the mountains snowboarding. It's my other big obsession. And I've been everywhere, from the Andes to the Alps. And so when I heard Kim Jong-un was building a ski resort in North Korea, of course, I went to check it out. It was January 2014. Ma Xinyang Ski Resort had just opened, so I was one of the first foreigners on the slopes. And frankly, I felt sick to my stomach, practically having this whole ski resort to myself, knowing it cost millions of dollars to build, money that could have been spent in the impoverished communities surrounding these pristine slopes. Most of the time in North Korea, I'm the one chasing North Koreans, trying to get them to talk. But at Ma Xinyang, the North Koreans were chasing me. They had never seen a snowboarder much less a Korean woman on a snowboard. They kept skiing over to ask me where I was from, the United States, where I had learned to snowboard, California, and whether I'd be willing to teach them to snowboard one day, of course. I asked them how they got so good at skiing, and they told me it was their job, all day, every day, to learn how to ski. And even then, I was wondering what all this was for. It had been announced years earlier that South Korea was going to host the 2018 Winter Olympics. So did Kim Jong-un build this resort with those games in mind? If so, that seemed totally far-fetched in the months immediately before the Olympics because, as we've heard, 2017 was a big year for sabre-rattling by North Korea. They staged one missile test after another, sending a clear message about their advancing capabilities to both of its sworn enemies, South Korea and the United States. At times in that year, 2017, it felt like there was a real threat of war here. And yet, after all that, Kim Jong-un says to South Korea, let's play ice hockey together. What's his game? Well, as counterintuitive as it might seem, my take is that Kim was calculating that all those threats and missile tests would guarantee North Korea a place in the Olympics. Whatever happened to KAL Flight 858 happened so quickly that the pilots didn't have time to send an emergency mayday message. Remember we told you in season one about what happened the last time South Korea hosted the Olympics in 1988. The Korean authorities in Seoul have linked the crash to a possible terrorist bomb aimed at wrecking next year's Olympic Games. North Korea tried to disrupt those games by bombing a South Korean commercial flight, creating an atmosphere of terror. Well, the missile and nuclear tests that North Korea carried out in the months leading up to these Olympics are Kim Jong-un trying a similar strategy. Those tests sent a message that if South Korea wants athletes and tourists to feel safe and relaxed at these games, they better consider giving Kim Jong-un what he wants. And what he wants is to be invited and included. Right, and I suppose Kim Jong-un also gets a great publicity coup. Showing off North Korea's ice hockey players, as well as the figure skaters and skiers they sent, is a good distraction from headlines about human rights abuses, or cybercrimes for that matter. This has big consequences for hockey player Randy Griffin and her teammates. It took three years of long days of training and team building over karaoke and Korean fried chicken for the South Korean, American and Canadian players to build a rapport. And now they're supposed to meld with a new set of players from North Korea of all countries. And so it it was a really difficult situation. Two weeks before the Olympics, you really want to be gelling as a team. You don't want people freaking out. And then when did the North Koreans arrive? How did this happen? How did they introduce you? The introduction was a, a little bit of a, an event, I guess, um, or production. So we were at a, a training facility. The media was there already. And the North Koreans arrived by bus. They were dressed up in these little kind of Russian looking getups. They had, you know, the fuzzy hats and these kind of red coats. <laughs> they looked very formal. And they, they just got off the bus and we gave them flowers as a welcome present. You had to give them the flowers, which is hilarious to me because that's so North Korean. It's such a North Korean ritual. They come from completely different worlds, from countries that are still technically locked in a state of war. It's normally illegal for North Koreans and South Koreans to communicate, but now their governments are pushing them together and forcing them to play happy families. The players are asked to smile for the cameras, 
there's a palpable tension among the South Korean team because they're wondering which of them will be benched to make way for the new North Korean players. It's not exactly easy bringing these two groups together, especially when the North Korean players are being so strictly monitored. Our coaches told us that they had special arrangements for them. So at this training facility, there were multiple dormitories. They had like a closed off section of one where they just made sure that there is no Wi-Fi there. They would meet us at meals, but they also had a line that whenever the North Koreans come to the dining hall, they would turn off all the televisions. We normally had televisions just playing in the background. Oh my God. Um, and so it was sort of weird. Like you would know that they were coming because all of a sudden all the TVs would go off and then they all come in and, and it would be kind of creepy. When they hit the ice, they discover yet another obstacle, language. It turns out the South Koreans and the North Koreans use entirely different hockey terms. The South Koreans yell out pass when calling for a pass. That's a mix of Korean and English that we call Konglish. While the North Koreans say yalla, which means contact in Korean. So someone ends up scribbling out a little dictionary to help the team communicate. To add to the pressure, the unified Korea team causes instant controversy in South Korea. Before the games officially begin, they play a friendly against Sweden, and the drama starts even before they enter the stadium. At that game, I remember we were driving through protests, essentially, outside the rink, and I think that was the first moment where we just saw how many people there were and how much of a, a divide there were. People who felt really strongly that this was a great thing. People who felt really strongly that it was a terrible thing. And so I think it was a little overwhelming to just see all of these people waiting for us. Supporters of the unified team are chanting Peace Olympics, while protesters across the street are shouting Pyongyang Olympics. One protester tramples on a picture of leader Kim Jong-un, another rips up the unified Korea flag. While many South Koreans are excited and even emotional at the idea of North and South Korean athletes uniting on the ice, others just can't stand the thought of their country teaming up with North Korea, especially if it means that some South Korean hockey players might have to sacrifice their Olympic dreams to make room for North Koreans. The team don't play as badly as they feared in this first game. They lose 3-1, but Sweden are a top team. And the Olympics hasn't even formally started yet. A few days later, the opening ceremony gets underway and it's full of fireworks, flags, and K-pop. Everything looks great, but backstage, things were about to go badly wrong. South Korea prides itself on being at the cutting edge, and this event is a high-tech roller coaster. Behind the scenes is a sprawling mass of camera technology, internet streams, apps, web pages, servers, and as the lights come up on the opening ceremony, all that tech starts to fall apart. You haven't forgotten about those hackers we mentioned earlier, have you? The ones circling these games? Well, they've chosen this exact moment when the whole world is watching to strike. I remember these Winter Olympics. I was there to provide commentary for the BBC and other news outlets. So it's Friday, February 9th, 2018, the day of the opening ceremony. It's just snowed like crazy, great conditions on the slopes, but it's bitterly cold. And inside the Olympic Stadium, everyone's squeezing hand warmers, and all the reporters in the stands have given up trying to type. They're shivering too hard to do anything but sit back and watch the show. A bell tolls, and then the stadium explodes with light. 20,000 fireworks in a dazzling, highly synchronized pyrotechnical show. The world's best winter athletes walk in. Most are bundled up in snowsuits, except for the flag bearer from Tonga, who strides out shirtless, wearing just a traditional tavala wrapped around his waist. For South Korea, it's a triumphant moment, a chance to show how much the nation has grown since hosting the Summer Olympics 30 years earlier. A celebration of peace after months of tension. Everything seems to be unfolding without a hitch. But as the opening ceremony gets underway, the IT starts to malfunction. At first, it just seems like a few minor glitches. The electronic ticketing gates at Olympic venues stop functioning, so security guards have to check people's tickets one by one. Long lines begin to form. Then the Wi-Fi cuts out in the stadium. Then the official Pyeongchang Olympics app goes down. 
Next, thousands of internet-connected TVs broadcasting the ceremony around the venue suddenly go black, including at the press centre where reporters are trying to watch. Something's going badly wrong. The Olympic Games are under digital attack. Hackers have found a way in. The digital infrastructure behind these games is being looked after by a huge team of about 150 people. They've been working toward this moment for years. In the Technology Operations Centre, that IT team is battling to fix the problem, desperately trying to get all the systems back online. They've got just a couple of hours before the opening ceremony finishes. At that point, the crowds are going to spill out of the stadium. They'll check the app on their phones, which has all their tickets and hotel bookings, and discover it's not working. It'll be a disaster and a very public one. And who knows what else the hackers have got up their sleeves. This could get even worse. The techies aren't just battling a computer virus, they're trying to save face, to defend South Korea's reputation when the eyes of the world are upon it. Miraculously, they manage to fix the app before the ceremony ends. But it's not over yet. They still have glitches in their systems, and they need to make sure they're totally rid of these hackers so that they can't try something like this again. The team works through the night. They take all the computers offline and remove all traces of the virus and painstakingly rebuild their servers one by one. It's an incredible feat by these unseen tech heroes. By eight o'clock the next morning, when they restart the whole system, everything's working, and the hackers have been banished from the network. It seems most people at the opening ceremony didn't even notice any problems, maybe because it was so cold and they weren't on their phones too much. I certainly wasn't aware of it as it was happening until Olympic officials went public with it the next day. Olympic organizers are investigating a possible cyber attack on their internet and Wi-Fi systems before the opening ceremony. The officials are concerned. The news coverage that follows speculates about who could be behind this hack and why they did it. Thousands of miles away from South Korea, those questions are going to lead a group of tech experts to make a bunch of bewildering discoveries. As the hack was unfolding on the night of the opening ceremony, a sample of the virus behind it was posted to an online database for security researchers. It's called Virus Total. It's not clear who uploaded it, but it's likely it was someone in the Olympic tech team. Databases like Virus Total are pretty amazing. They hold samples of viruses that have been found in attacks on targets all over the world, sort of like a zoo for malware. Cybersecurity professionals can upload their own samples and check for any matches with attacks that have happened elsewhere. And that gives them clues about who the attacker is and how to stop them. Once the sample's uploaded to the database, anyone in the tech security community can see it. Intriguing new samples immediately attract attention. So now there's a worldwide community of tech sleuths poring over this code. Among them is Warren Mercer. Back in 2018, he was an analyst at a company called Cisco Talos, part of the tech giant Cisco. His worldwide team call themselves big game malware hunters. In other words, in that zoo of malware, they're interested in the biggest, scariest beasts. Warren starts working away at it in his cozy home office in Belfast, Northern Ireland, the other side of the world from the action in South Korea. He pretty quickly realises that this isn't the work of a low-level attacker trying to cause a nuisance. This was a sophisticated piece of malware performing sophisticated actions and disruptive actions. Disruptive actions like going after the computer servers that support the entire Olympic infrastructure. The app, the Wi-Fi, electronic tickets, TV screens. This virus was... Fundamentally trashing these machines along the way. So it could have trashed the wireless access controller, it could have trashed the ticket and system software. And the idea behind that was essentially that it would damage the machine and make it irreparable and unable to be used again. We started naming it Olympic Destroyer. It was a destructive piece of malware that tried to disrupt and embarrass the Olympic Games at the time. Humiliation. That seems to be the real goal here. So now we have a means, the virus, and a motive, embarrassment. But who's the suspect? Warren starts looking for clues and quickly spots some very interesting digital fingerprints. But what was really interesting is Olympic Story with this wiper destruction functionality, almost identical to the malware that was used in the Bangladesh Bank and Heist. Some of the functionality was identical. So that, that made Lazarus Group look Okay, that, that certainly makes you a suspect. Using the same malicious code? Sounds like a smoking gun to me. Looks like the Lazarus Group's been caught red-handed again, right? Despite the diplomatic front he's presenting at these games, has Kim Jong-un decided to embarrass the South Koreans with a cyber attack? 
The Lazarus Group had been targeting South Korea for years before the 2014 Sony attack brought the hacking ring worldwide infamy. So it's no surprise that some news reports began pointing fingers north of the DMZ. But Warren's not making any hasty judgments. There's still a lot of work to do before he and his colleagues can be absolutely sure what they're looking at. And while the international cyber community is getting to the bottom of the hack, Randy is readying herself for the Unified Korea team's first competitive game against Switzerland. We basically were bracing ourselves for humiliation. As she skates out onto the ice, Randy realizes the crowd's not too focused on the team's entrance, because everyone's mesmerized instead by North Korea's enormous cheerleading squad. There are more than 200 of them. They're wearing bright red matching outfits. They've got beaming smiles on their faces. Videos of their carefully choreographed dances quickly go viral. South Korean media dubbed them an army of beauties. They become such celebrities at these games that the crowds go wild when they walk into the stands. But Randy is not so excited to see them. They were just very robotic, like they did the same chants over and over, and they would just do their their cheers and their chants completely independently of what was going on in the game. So, you know, we could be completely getting destroyed, like, and they could be chanting, like, we are one, we're going to win, or something like that. Was that distracting? A little bit. And I think there were definitely times where we were just watching them versus oh the game. God. I mean, I, I think probably for a lot of the the fans in the arena as well. They're not there for the hockey game as much. They were there for the spectacle. And so probably seeing these weird North Korean cheerleaders was a big part of the event for them. I think as athletes in that moment, we want people to be focused on on the game and on our performance after all our hard work. And when it feels like instead we're just another part of of a circus that people have come to gawk at because they heard there's a circus happening here, I guess felt like not not what we had wanted the experience to be. So so yeah, overall, I don't think we were huge fans of the North Korean cheerleaders. <laughs> the team lose this debut match 8-0. With each of Switzerland's goals, North Korea's cheerleaders chant, cheer up, cheer up. North Korea takes cheerleading very seriously. In fact, Kim Jong-un's wife was a former cheerleader. These young women are a key part of Kim Jong-un's charm offensive here. But if this is a charm offensive, what about the cyber attack? Warren Mercer and the cyber sleuth community are turning up seemingly solid evidence that North Korea were, in fact, trying to digitally wreck these games. But nothing is as it seems here. Randy is about to see her North Korean teammates in a very different light. While Warren and his fellow investigators are going to make some stunning discoveries about what lies behind the Olympic destroyer attack. That's next time on The Lazarus Heist. The Lazarus Heist is an original podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Jeff White. And I'm Jean Lee. Our producer is Viv Jones. Our original music was composed by Magnus Fiennes and Il Wu from the South Korean band Jambanai. And as ever, We'd love to hear your feedback. Please keep leaving us those ratings and reviews, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. And spread the word on social media using the hashtag LazarusHeist. Thank you for listening. Listener.